Herbert Hoover had already gone down in history before the start of World War II. Among his many accomplishments and failures in that period, he became the only man to ever sit in both the Oval Office and the same room as Adolf Hitler. Herbert Hoover remains one of the better known presidents of the United States, though not for the reasons a head of state might wish. The voting public held him responsible for the Great Depression, a stigma that remains attached to his name even after decades of historical research has put the economic downturn and his efforts to fight it into context. In just three years, unemployment jumped from two to 13 million. Those relief efforts were stymied in part by Hoover's own stubbornness and poor political skills. Unfortunately, his shortcomings as a leader in an economic crisis were only heightened by his bitterness and defeat. Angry that his successor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, would not heed his advice on the Depression during the transition, the Washington Post reported that Hoover called FDR a madman, while the UVA Miller Center reports that he described the New Deal as fascistic. Hoover's hostility to the Roosevelt administration made little difference during the election of 1936, and his unpopularity even led many Republicans to keep him at a distance. Despite his loss and poor reputation, Hoover continued to make genuine attempts at making a positive impact on the world. Before becoming president, Hoover had worked strenuously on post-World War I European relief, and many European nations honored him during the 1930s. This work caused him to travel overseas often, and it was on one of these trips that, in 1938, he was brought face-to-face -face with Adolf Hitler. It was the only time in his life that Hitler met a U.S. president, sitting or retired. It was an enlightening visit for Hoover, and an occasion for sensational overblown headlines back in America. Germany wasn't Herbert Hoover's final destination when he went to Europe in 1938. Rather, the German government invited him to visit while he was en route to Poland. Surviving paperwork, which was later auctioned off by Alexander Historical Auctions, reveals the details that went into preparing for Hoover's arrival. Reportedly, it was decided that Hoover would be brought to Adolf Hitler's personal residence, and government officials planned to receive the former president there upon his arrival. However, all this planning may not have been necessary had Hoover followed his first instinct. Reportedly, he was reluctant to make a stop in Nazi Germany on his way to Poland. After leaving office, he was an outspoken critic of fascism and communism for the ways both infringed on personal liberty. Relations between Germany and the United States were souring in 1938, which frustrated the Nazi government's efforts to secure trade agreements. The fact that America and Germany stood for such widely opposing ideologies was already becoming a fixed notion, even without the prospect of war on the immediate horizon. German officials compiled a list of talking points in preparation for the meeting, some of which summarized the existing tensions between the nations. Others concerned Hoover's well-known resentment for the Roosevelt administration. In one of his reports, General Baron Baron Freitag von Lorenhoven suggested engaging Hoover on the subject of Roosevelt, drawing out his opinions and his complaints about the New Deal. The reports also outlined lines of attack on the New Deal and advised denying any attempted influence by Nazi Germany on organizations like the American Federation of Labor. Hoover arrived in Berlin in March 1938. While there were other items on his itinerary, his 40-minute private audience with Hitler was understandably the most well-documented. Much of what we know about their meeting comes from a summary held in the National Archives based on translations of the meeting. According to this document, Hoover began his meeting with Hitler on a positive note. He favorably compared the state of Germany in 1938 to what he beheld 20 years earlier after the end of World War I. He highlighted how, after the war, Germany was, quote, depressed and despondent, but the nation's environment seemed much more lively and optimistic at the time of their meeting. He told Hitler that, compared to the United States, Germany's economic progress was rapidly outpacing America's. However, Hoover qualified this praise by noting that America's slower pace at building programs and organizations to facilitate such growth was due to the country's commitment to personal liberty. Action of labor and management which is one of the high purposes of the Recovery Act. According to the Washington Post, Hitler replied that Germany couldn't afford to indulge such notions as it built itself up. The details of Hoover's meeting with Hitler were not available to the public for several years after the meeting, and at the time, Hoover had little to say on the subject. As he told the United Press, I never discussed the character of such private conversations. Even so, the press widely reported that an anonymous source had divulged that the meeting turned into a contentious argument between the politicians. Headlines and stories loudly proclaimed that Hoover had fiercely defended the virtues of personal liberty against Hitler and Nazism. The claims were denied by both parties, and the translation of their meeting would later disprove these reports. While there were some tensions surrounding the meeting, it concerned a member of the press rather than an ideological disagreement. According to the National Archives, Paul Smith of the San Francisco Chronicle was with Hoover in Germany, and Hoover requested that the journalist accompany him to the meeting with Hitler in place of another individual. The request was denied, officially because it was too late to change the arrangements. 
However, it's more likely that Smith was refused because his newspaper often featured harsh criticism of Nazism. Hoover may not have given Hitler a stern talking to over liberty, but he did take with him some strong impressions of life under Nazi Germany that reinforced his hostility to fascism. According to the Presidential Primary Sources Project, Hoover was well aware that the Nazi regime's harshest realities were hidden from him during the trip. To confirm these suspicions, he left Berlin and visited the outskirts of Germany where intellectuals confided in him the truth. The rest of his journey did little to assuage his concerns about the state of Europe, and he returned from the tour with a heightened understanding of how complex the situation with Germany was. But despite all he had seen, Hoover was still strongly opposed to any U.S. intervention in another European war. He wanted to avoid American involvement in a European war that would ally the U.S. with Soviet Russia, even if the fight was against fascism. Hateful of both ideologies and convinced that another war was coming, Hoover hoped that a war between Germany and Russia might see Hitler and Joseph Stalin finish each other off. Hoover did not believe Hitler would choose to strike the West when so much of his rhetoric was aimed against the East. As late as 1941, he opposed American involvement and the Roosevelt administration's Lend-Lease offering to the Soviets. According to the Miller Center, it was only after Pearl Harbor that Hoover came out in support of America's entry into World War II. 